Next up is uh, our uh, first year fellow, Dr. Uh, Charles Calvo, otherwise known as CJ. He's going to be talking about whether or not we need to come in at 3 in the morning to fix the retinal detachment. His uh, title of his talk is, What is the Optimal Timing of Retinal Detachment Repair? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm CJ. Uh, thanks for being here. So I wanted to look into or really see what the evidence had to say about when, when are we best uh, to fix a retinal detachment. So we know in ophthalmology there are a couple of clear, cut and dry emergencies. Endophthalmitis, angle closure, glaucoma, uh, ruptured globe, giant cell arteritis. These are things that require treatment immediately. And we know that a retinal attachment is, you know, more emergent than say getting a, you know, fake emulsification done on a cataract, but like where does it, where does it stand? So we wanted to look carefully and see really what does the evidence say about this problem. So uh, first off, retinal attachment is a very common problem. They say in, you know, in the literature that like one in 10,000 lifetime or annual risk, but I think a better way of saying it is that one in 170 eyes will develop a retinal attachment in their life. So that's a very frequent uh, problem. And this was once an inoperable, um, inoperable problem. Once it happened, you know, it was incurable until um, in the 1920s, a Swiss ophthalmologist, Jules Gonin, kind of created the first technique using a cautery. We would actually cauterize the retina through the sclera. Sounds very painful and awful, but that was the first, uh, first technique that was around to give these people a chance. And then really the next big breakthrough in RD repair was in the 1950s with Charles Scapin, who <coughs> invented uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy, and that really allowed us to uh, go into some other techniques like scleral buckling, and then now we, where we are today in 2018, uh, anatomic success rates are very high, over 85% over, you know, for mild or moderate complex uh, primary retinal attachments. So it's really come a long way in the, last, uh, in the last century. We know that the visual outcomes are, and, in, and this is true in a lot of problems in ophthalmology, they're really related to what the preoperative visual acuity was. And the way that we commonly classify this is retinal attachments as macula on, meaning that the fovea is still attached versus macula off. And if your macula is on, you have a really good uh, chance of having great vision. 80% of Mac on RDs uh, obtain 2040 vision or better, as opposed to 30% for those that were macula off. So of course, it's, it, it would make sense to want to fix these while the macula is still on. But there's lots of uh, non-modifiable risk factors that influence the, the visual outcomes. How old the patient is, what's their lens status, how large is the RD? Do they have proliferative vitreo retinopathy? So there's a lot of things that we can't change, but the one thing that you know, we can change is when are we gonna do the surgery? So this is the most uh, obvious uh, modifiable risk factor, and they talk about this duration of macular detachment, DMD, as one way uh, of looking at this in, in the literature. It's basically from when did that retinal attachment start till when did they get it fixed? And that uh, is what a lot of the studies look at. And so. Obviously, the logical assumption is, is, you know, sooner is better. We need to get it done. So should we do it immediately today? Should I cancel all the clinic and get that already fixed now? Should I do it in a week? Should I have done it yesterday? I think um, there's a lot of questions that come from that. So um, in terms of basic science research, they've done a lot of uh, work in animals, uh, non-primates, rabbits, where they're inducing a retinal attachment. And we've seen that there's cellular and there's molecular changes that happen almost immediately within minutes of, um, of the detachment. We see that you know, the Mueller micro, uh, microglial cells in the retina, they have inflammatory changes that um, start within hours, they evolve, and they can actually uh, even uh, induce changes in parts of the retina that are not detached. And then we know that when the retina is detached, the outer retina obtains its uh, nourishment from the chorio capillaries and the inner retina uh, uh, receives its nourishment from the, uh, the retinal arteries. But actually, there's evidence that shows that even the inner retina uh, becomes hypoxic because there's reduced uh, retinal blood flow um, due to the abnormal ana anatomical changes. However, if we go to clinical data, the clinical evidence really suggests that the visual outcomes depend less on time to surgery than you would expect. And so 
There's been lots and lots and lots of research on this and multiple retrospective or hundreds of patients demonstrate that there's really no difference in vision of uh, those pa patients who are operated within one week. So we're going to dive into and kind of see what those have to say. So this uh, series has 104 patients with MAC off RDs. And as we see, let's see, do I have a pointer? So we see over here, um, the pre-op vision in all of these patients is pretty poor, somewhere around 20... 400 to 20 over 600, and their uh, duration of macular attachment is anywhere from one day to seven days. And the outcome in this study was the vision at 11 months, and we can see across this whole group, regardless if they got their surgery the first day or the seventh day, all their visions kind of ended up in the 2050 to 2060 range, and you see that from day one to two, day three to four, day five to seven, that everyone kind of ended up in that 2050 range. In another uh, study with uh, 94 patients with MAC off RDs, and all these patients had very poor vision going in. They all were 2,200 or worse. And how they grouped the patients, they grouped them into three groups. Those that have had their MAC, that had a retinal attachment for one to 10 days, from 10, to 10 days to six weeks, and then greater than six weeks. And obviously, um, as we see here, again, there's a significantly better visual outcomes uh, in the group of patients that were repaired from one to 10 days compared to the others. And so we see here their uh, preoperative uh, or their uh, mean postoperative vision in the less than 10 day group, their vision is like 2040, uh, their mean vision 2040. So that's pretty good compared to the um, 11 days to six weeks, which was 20 over 125 to like 20 over 180. So pretty similar, but a, a big difference in vision between that first group to the second and the third group. So then they did subgroup analysis. Well, let's break down that one to 10 day group. Let's see if there's really a change in there. Maybe did the people that got their surgery in one day, did they do better? And really what we're seeing here is that they, you know, despite their visions all being pretty awful at the beginning, mean visions from 2,400 to 20 over 1,400, so very poor vision, at the end of the day, um, they all ended up having vision about that 2030 to 2050 range, regardless of whether they were the first day or the 10th day. So Can, can I just point out a statistical yes. issue? So uh, the one concern when you start splitting down to groups that are small as four and five or six is all it takes is one outlier to see a different problem. So I think the true statement here is, is that I don't think there's enough power here to, you know, to ascertain whether there's, there's truly differences in those different groups. Okay. I think it's important that we understand that, that, that you can look at trends, but I, I think it would be very hard to make a statistical statement as, as at least we were as small as some of the groups are. So. Yeah, and then that kind of goes back to that is the uh, a big concern with any surgical evidence because usually the number of patients are smaller, every patient's different, surgeon. So there definitely are a lot of um, accepted. There's no weaknesses. obvious trend. When you look at it, there's an obvious trend, but it, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. hard to make a definitive statement. Yeah, I know there's battle. True. And, and, you know, as the associate editor of AJO, we get these that are somewhat underpowered, and you get another underpowered study, and, and it, it's just it's hard to definitively answer. And this, this is a question that was um, argued vehemently clear back when I was a resident. Mm -hmm. That was almost 100 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I agree. Within, you know, breaking down the one to ten days, you know, the evidence is there and even though it is may not be the strongest evidence or have the biggest power, but this is the best research that we have in twenty eighteen. Agreed. And it is what we have. So we have to work with what we have. You know, I do think there's some utility in it though. I mean even if you I mean for me like a one to four day is like a pretty quick window to get something fixed, you know, maybe one to three, but if you then, you know, take that, you've got 34 in that first group and yeah. you know, 24 in that second, and it still looks like there wouldn't, wouldn't really be a difference. Probably yeah. The biggest takeaway of this is really, you know, I think they did the subgroup analysis to kind of uh, give any, or to answer the questions of the naysayers of this data, but the biggest question, or the biggest thing this really said was, there's a huge difference between the first group and everything after. And that's really the takeaway, is people within the first 10 days did fairly well. They got good vision. Everyone else got poor vision at the end of the day. That's really the takeaway of the study, not the 
1 to 10 groups. And these are all Mac off RDs too. I haven't got to Mac on yet. Okay, so what about Mac ons? Let's talk about those. So in this series of uh, 199 fovea sparing RDs that were uh, present for less than seven days, uh, this uh, study was done in Miami. 85% of those patients were repaired within three days of uh, presentation. They only uh, did surgery on weekends or holidays for six of the 199 cases. And this is the interesting thing about the paper. Only one of, of these retinal attachments progressed from fovea on to fovea off before surgery, which is a half of a percent. And that's, that's a pretty interesting thing. And 75% of these patients had uh, post-op vision better than 2040, which kind of supports um, the outcomes of MAC on attachments. And they noted that there was no difference in visual outcomes between patients operated on the first, second, or third day. And they didn't find any correlation between the location of the retinal attachment and proximity to the macula. So what this ends up kind of, uh, it, it raises questions of are retinal attachments that were MAC off, were they destined to always be MAC off? Did they immediately go MAC off? And MAC on attachments, do they kind of stay on? Are they slow? Have they kind of halt? Have they progressed to a point and then they, they are arrested in that progression? So um, this, there was one other study that looked at how quickly does a macula on detachment become macula off? So they had 82 patients with a fovea sparing RDs and they repaired them within one to six days and the, the mean uh, uh, time was 2.3 days. So only 11% of patients from when they first presented to the time of surgery uh, had progression of the retinal attachment. And only in 3%, three of the 82 patients developed the macula off retinal attachment before surgery. So they determined that in the cases that did have progression, the RD progressed 1.8 disc diameters per day, which kind of seems like a lot. Um, but given the, pre the previous study and this study, it didn't seem that retinal progression from Mac on to Mac off happened that frequently. But this was the only one that really has any, the only thing in the literature that actually talks about a rate, 1.8 disc diameters per day. One study looking at 88 eyes um, versus on same day surgery versus next day surgery. So there were 88 uh, fovea sparing, half of them uh, were operated on the same day and half of them were operated on the next. They found that there was no uh, difference in vision at the three month mark, uh, the, the mean visual acuity <coughs> was 2030. However, there was a statistically significant increase in the amount of operative time, um, about three hours versus two and a half hours um, on the case that was same day, it took longer to do. And in this study, which was done like in 2015, um, they stated given at their local OR, that their OR cost was $62 uh, per minute, that it had like a mean increase of 1600 bucks per case if you did it on the same day. There's other evidence that supports that as well, that the same day cases do cost more, even though the outcomes are the same. Why is that? Um, well, you could, um, if you came on a weekend when we did a retinal attachment repair at the main, if you came with us, you'd see, um, because the OR, there's a lot more prep that has to come, because it's not, it's not your normal turf. Things have to be transported in. Um, there's ancillary staff, there's different anesthesia techniques, um, uh, unusual uh, environments. Um, so things take a little bit longer. Uh, okay. But so that was that same thing for that study. They they were operating same day versus versus same day in a different day. environment. Same, same day, same day. As as I as I understand, it, but what what happens here is that if it's same day and you can pop it into the regular schedule, it's probably not a different time. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing same day, so you've got to you got to figure out how you're trying to do it at the end of the day, or you're going to go, you know, like you say, the main or the rest. That that there's just issues associated with loss of efficiency and yeah. there's a strong reason why the surgeon from Ram Eye Center will almost give their left leg not have to go to the main OR. Absolutely. Why not, right? Yeah, you really get, in, in, an, in an eye hospital that's, uh, you know, so well oiled, like Marin, we're all spoiled to it, when you have to then go and operate in a, in a general hospital that was doing a, a C-section in that room before, you really realize how lucky you are to be in a eye-only OR. 
Uh, so we used to operate, I, mean, I go back to the days when that's what it was, mm -hmm. and, and I call it the deer in the headlight look, you'd ask for something and everybody's yeah. like, what in the world is he talking yeah. about? Now we, when we go to the main OR, we bring our eye crew with us, but the big difference that we deal with is anesthesia. Um, they're not our same uh, anesthesia uh, providers there. Um, there's anesthesia residents, um, they're unfamiliar with um, doing, you know, monitored anesthesia care with the retro bulbar block. There are some differences there, so it does take a lot longer. Um, and then you have, you know, we try to be as well prepared as we can and bring everything. There's always at least 10 to 12 points of friction, I'd call. Yeah. It's just interesting yeah. how you think. I mean, it's way better. If we, if we had to do, uh, there's a time we had to use staff there who have no, no experience whatsoever. That's frankly scary. That's dangerous. Yeah. And so that's why we've taken it, and with our staff there, it helps. But it, it, it is, as you look at it and review it, those who've been there, they're just, there's just these points of friction that seem to go in that make that mm -hmm. a, a much more difficult slow, just asking for something. Yeah. Now and somebody's got to run over and find it and come back. Exactly, yeah, exactly. That's the big thing. You try to be as well prepared and bring everything you can think of to the case, but then something happens and you need an instrument or the vitrectomy machine uh, starts to sputter. And then you got to send the nurse, and they got to run all the way back over to Marin, and they got to push it back over. And then you sit there, and the patient's under anesthesia for 30 minutes, and you're it. So it it, it does uh, it, it is not the same. So when I was going through this evidence of uh, looking through the literature, I started seeing this thing called the weekend effect, and it was not really described in the ophthalmology literature because we're usually a Monday through Friday uh, type of group, but in the general surgery the obstetric literature, they talk about this stuff a lot. And there's, there's many, many, many papers about it. And so what this weekend effect is, is that there have been documented poor surgical outcomes, higher complications, longer and more expensive uh, admissions for patients that have surgery on the weekends rather than Monday through Friday. And, and this is, you know, gallbladders and appendectomies and emergency C-sections and all types of bowel obstructions. They have evidence for every type of problem like that. And they have all um, really uh, chalked it up, or their theories are, you know, on the weekend, they have lower weekend staffing. Um, things take longer to get done. Um, there's an unfamiliar ancillary staff. They're not used to doing these things usually. And then there's physician and staff fatigue who, you know, we work hard Monday through Friday and then having to do uh, a unplanned surgery in the weekend um, can take a toll on you. But the best thing that I've learned from this, which I think is really promising, is that there's good evidence that supports that hospitals that did have the weekend effect, they were able to overcome it with institutional changes. So they, it's not, there's not something magic that causes your case to be cursed on Saturday and Sunday. You can fix it by identifying the problems and staffing, training people, trying to recreate your Monday through Friday scenarios on the weekend. Probably not completely. Probably not completely. True. You, you can go a long way, but there is evidence that that's there's still there's a reason why people do not want to try to come and have it done there. Just, just as a there's another one that's well known. Everybody, any heard of the July effect? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a very real one too. You know, I don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll take you off the corner. Let you understand the July effect. Um, it's probably true that we've actually had we've been working on some, uh, this weekend and after hours effect a little bit because that is a general hospital that we operate at. And if we have to add on the cataract or glaucoma case, um, well, you know, there's been multiple times where I've had a team come in that doesn't even know how to turn on or uh, you know, get the constellation set up. And so we've got a dedicated eye team to, you know, so we've kind of watched this whole process unfold a little bit at the primary. It's been interesting. Yeah. So the conclusions. Um, from the evidence is, you know, uh, retinal attachment repair should be performed at the earliest reasonable surgical opportunity. And there's lots of considerations, um, OR availability, staff availability. What's the preoperative health of the patient? Does this patient have aortic stenosis and should they get an echo before the surgery? Um, you know, are they on an anticoagulant? Um, do they have caretakers available if they're going to be face down or if they're going to, if this is their only eye and we're putting gas in it and they're going to be visually um, disabled after the surgery, should we do it right now or should we wait until their son or daughter can be available to take care of them? So there's lots of things that go into this decision on when to fix a retinal attachment. And so 
Um, I think that just saying that this is an emergency, you need to have your surgery today, is probably a, um, would probably be a mistake to say that. It's a little bit more complicated and there are lots of concerns that need to be looked at. So what the evidence really says is that macula off Rental attachments can be repaired within seven to 10 days with no impact on visual outcome. And that macula sparing retinal attachments can be deferred for a short period of time. And, um, and that does not compromise the visual outcome. So really the evidence does support that the RD repair is an urgent, but it's not an, ur an emergent surgery. So practically, practically, just asking here, we've got some of our retinal colleagues in place. Today, if we have a macula on attachment that shows up on Saturday morning, do we do it on the weekend or do we wait until Monday? I would say that it, it, it depends. Um, you know, it's an inferior detachment and it's not threatening the fluid. We'll probably wait until, wait until the Monday. Week. It's a superior temporal detachment that's coming out along the superior. Okay. Okay. We do a fair number of dramatic retina pexies here, which are a fairly easy procedure to do in the office. They don't have as high success rate, but so you know, probably a good 75% of those We'll do fine with that if, if we want to do that. So that's another option too that you can do if you don't want to defer surgery. I have done one case at the main OR in the last five years. I don't do it, you know, like if you avoid it. So, you know, my general rule of thumb is a MAC on detachment. I try to get repaired within 24 hours, uh, MAC off within a week. So, so middle of the night, never, essentially. I can't, yeah. I can't think of a reason. It used to be that was, yeah, that was a lot of middle of night surgery. Part of the problem is sometimes we'll get somebody sent in from an outside, you know, whoever, optometrist or somebody, vision's 2200, patients had decreased vision for three or four days. They're coming in, they're told, I need surgery today. My doctor, I have to come in now and have surgery. And I'll say, you know, maybe it's Wednesday and I have surgery Friday. And I'll say, well, I'm going to put you on my schedule Friday. My doctor told me I had to have it today or not. And then it's a, it's a more re-education educating the patient about that but if they have the patient ends up with maybe a less than stellar visual outcome they're always going to question that no, exactly they're always going to question that well exactly. I get operated on I saw you the yeah. first day I was, I was but gonna, I have done better yeah I was going to bring that up I think it is totally reasonable for a referring ophthalmologist or optometrist to say you have a retinal attachment I think you need to see <laughs> a retina specialist today but it yeah. does there's an absolutely no benefit whatsoever in telling the patient that you need surgery today all that does is erode that doctor and patient relationship and they'll always question it in the future and say well I'm 2040 and it's probably your fault because I didn't get it on the same day it's it's really not the referring physician's place to say that it only it only bad things come from saying that and, and, and can I just add to that is <clears throat> I think it's reasonable also for the referring physician to say but why don't you stay NPO just yeah. in case they, yeah. they want to do that or they are able to do it or they deem that it's important for you well, some, and sometimes we will i mean if it's yeah. on friday and i've got right. room in the, if they come in in the morning they need to back up because i'm fine i got room in the afternoon we'll do it today and we yeah. work as a team i mean i think the retina service here i i feel i can say this because i've been in other retina practices but the retina service here really works well to try to deliver the best care for the patients so sometimes if we do have someone urgent if somebody's on call or somebody and they can't do it, and there's another person who has time. Now that we have more time in the OR, I think that's really been really valuable. Yeah. With somebody with a retina surgeon in the OR every day, yeah, yeah, delaying it to the next person. Yeah, that's... Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.